So, let's do Peeper first and get cranking on this because I want to bang through Peeper quickly because he's pretty straightforward and I want to spend some time um, we'll be, spend some time on Sasha perhaps, we'll see where that goes, but I want to get into Prenner because Prenner's got some significant questions for us to wrestle with. All right, so let's just bang through this thing quickly. Um, so Peeper's whole section is the means of grace and that's where we are now if you haven't figured it out. We're done with the Holy Spirit. But not really, because the Holy Spirit is working through His means, so the means of grace are the vehicles of the Holy Spirit, the whole point. But that's where we're going now, so we're moving quickly. So we're doing means of grace, then we're going to do the Word of God, which is tomorrow, our next time's topic, then we're going to get right into the sacraments, baptism, Lord's Supper, and that sets us up finally for Christian life. So that's where we're cranking with this whole thing. All right, so the means of grace, it's really simple to think about this. And the best way to grasp means of grace is just this kind of little picture that I'll offer for you, and we're going to kind of come back to it on many occasions. So we have, we know grace is one for us where? So where does this happen? Yes. So on the cross, death and resurrection of Christ, in the actions of Jesus Christ crucified, we have grace won for us. Peeper in other places talks about this being objective justification, right? So whose sins were paid for on the cross? The world's. Everyone. It's all done. So we have this taken care of and it's all accomplished, all right? Now, I have over here though, Joe Sinner. Joe Sinner needs this grace, right? How does he get this grace? That's the whole point of the means of grace. The whole point is, how do we deliver this to the person over here? That's what we're dealing with. And the Im good imagery is to imagine a reservoir filled with water. And over here, we have a humble domicile that is in need of receiving water. And so, question is, how do you get the water from the reservoir, where you have millions of gallons, to the home that needs it? How might you get the water to the house? Creative, thinking, 21st century people. Aqueduct. How about an aqueduct? Let's be really creative, and we'll build ourselves a beautiful aqueduct, because they're cheap and efficient. We could do that. Would that get the water there? Be very Roman and very classical. How else could we do it? How else could we do it? We could build a water tower and pipes, assuming that our aqueduct is not quite high enough. We'll build a tower and we'll build a plumbing system and we'll actually get it there in a very efficient way. Cast iron, maybe even better PVC, and we'll get that water there clean and neat. So we could do it that way. Any other ways? You could get a helicopter and you could fly it over and you could shower it down and you could even have it fall as rain and get collected in the eaves troughs and go in the rain barrel. That'd be cool. Or you could dump it right into the, you know, their own little tank there. You could do a helicopter. Any other ways? You could get a water gun. You could get a water gun and shoot it. You could get a bunch of friends together and do a bucket brigade and line everybody up. All right. Now, how many ways can we get the water there? Lots of ways. Once the water arrives at the house, is it any different depending on how it got there? Water is water is water is water. It might be colder through the pipes than it is in the helicopter drop, but it's still the same water. Still H2O, still does the same stuff. This is the very premise of the idea of means of grace. Means of grace are nothing more than the conduit that delivers the grace. So the grace is won on the cross and delivered through the means. And so what are the means? The means are, as we know very well, you know this since you were a grade school kid, the Word and the sacraments. And all those are, are the conduit, the way to deliver it. And that's all means of grace are. So does the Word save you? Sure. But isn't it really God's grace that saves you? Well, of course. But how does it get here? It's through the conduit, through the means. And this is important because you'll get the smart aleck Baptist who will like to say things like, oh, so you say baptism saves you. Yes, I do. Well, Jesus saves me. I mean, like they just burned you, you know, like, whoa, I'm so much better because I've got Jesus. You just got your stinking baptism. What's wrong with you? And that's when you just kind of shake and say, you idiot. What is totally wrong with you? You know, how did you get Jesus? Well, he just came to me. Yeah, right. Spare me, dude. You get him through the means of grace. And whether that's the word proclaimed or the sacrament splashed on your head, same grace. Same grace. 
This is the cool thing. It's not mitigated. It's not lesser grace because, well, it's just baptismal grace. What do you mean, just? Grace is grace is grace. However it gets delivered, it's grace. So we're getting the same grace of God in baptism and in the absolution and in the Lord's Supper, same grace of God. And not little bits and pieces. Whenever God delivers grace, how much does he deliver? The whole thing. It's the only way he knows how to measure it. Comes in one size only, complete. And so you get all the grace you need at your baptism. So why bother with other means of grace? Because you're a human being. And you need multiple deliveries. And every time we fall short, we need the delivery again. Not a little bit more, but the whole thing one more time. God just keeps dumping and dumping and dumping. It's how he operates. Grace just comes, poosh, awesome. So this is the whole cool thing about means of grace. It's nothing more than how we deliver. It's not different grace. It's not different ways of getting saved. It's simply God's way of bringing the good news to me. So that's what means of grace are. We all cool here? This is the most basic premise we have here. Okay, this is the most basic thing. Yes, Amy. Say to me that means of grace are works in themselves. Well, sure, you can turn them into a work, and you can make it something you are accomplishing and doing, or you can treat the means like the Bible does, which is simply God's way of delivering the goods to me. What do I do to participate? Nothing. And see, this is where you go after Baptist. Well, I suppose if you treat baptism like you do, it would be a work, wouldn't it? Because you've got to decide something, don't you? But you see, when I was baptized, I had nothing to do with it. Somebody dragged me up and stuck my head under the water. I didn't even know what was going on. How cool is that? And then they'll say, so it's the faith of someone else who saves you? They'll say, I would say it's the faith of God being delivered to me. And I simply receive. And isn't it great that someone was faithful enough to bring the good news to me, just like somebody told you about Jesus? What if nobody ever opened their mouth around you? Where would you be today? All right. So we can play their game, too. Okay, good? And I know some of you guys who get involved in things like Campus Crusade and FCA deal with these kinds of people because they're thick in those places. So these are relevant. All right, now, <clears throat> so off we go. So the first thing we're going to talk about then is the word is the key part of this because we often even make the move of saying, okay, word and sacrament, and we almost treat it like a hierarchy. Word, ah, oh, that's the biggie, and then all oh, in sacraments too. But Prenner's going to sh shoot that down, isn't he? pretty pretty sternly, all right? Because his whole point is, it's all mediatory. It's all means. It's all a way of making something concrete. And here's the really cool thing that you need to start grasping about this whole idea of means of grace. The very power and beauty of it is the materiality of it. And see, it's the very thing that makes people scandalized by it and want to dismiss it that is the actual strength of it. Because it's just water. It's just some dude up there who's a really boring preacher. How can that be the Word of God? He's not even charismatic. He's not even interesting. How can a bit of crummy, dry bread and some really cheap wine, what do you mean holy means of grace, God's body and blood? You see, it's the concrete specificity that is the very power of it because you know where it is. And here's one of the cool things about Lutheran theology. It's the idea of the and I'm making this word up because it won't Google for you, or word check doesn't like it, but it's the very locatedness. It's right there. You know where it is. It's the locatedness of it. It's the specificity of it. So where is the gospel for me? It's where the pastor says, I forgive your sins. There's the gospel. Where's the gospel for me? It's where the pastor says, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Will you feel the water and hear the splashing? There's gospel. Where's the gospel? It's when the bread is on my tongue and the wine is going down in my guts and I can taste it when I burp a little later. Well, that's a little sacrilegious. No, it's rock and cool because it's real in your guts. It's concrete. It's specific, tangible. That's the power of it. You see, it's not wafting over there in some kind of spiritual realm where you've got to try to get in touch with your Jesus zone. It's right here for me. There I am in the bottom of the pit, wallowing. I can't even lift my head up off the mat. I'm dead. What am I going to do? Christ comes and he says, you poor, losing sinner. Here I am for you with all my grace. Here it is. And he just delivers it. And you just say, wow. wow. That's Christianity. That's Lutheranism. So we're getting to the core of the nitty-gritty of this stuff on the means of grace. All right. Okay? 
So we're off and running here. Now, the one thing you have to keep in mind for Peeper is Peeper is very much of the opinion he has a tendency to equate Word of God with, with Scripture. Peeper does this pretty consistently. For Peeper, Bible and Word of God are virtually synonyms. And so you notice this when you're reading Peeper. You'll, you'll, this kind of pops out. You have already been educated in your systematic sequence to think more broadly than this, right? Remember back in Lutheran mind, you learned a threefold definition for the Word of God. Remember that one? Drilled into your head. What's the first definition? The personal who is Christ. Second one is the spoken, the proclaimed, the oral, in your ears Word of God. And then the third one is? The written. Finally, we get to the Bible. The Bible comes in third place, bronze medal. And so, Jesus gets the gold, preaching gets the silver, Bible gets the bronze. How about that? How backward is that? Tell your Baptist friends that one. They'll enjoy it. All right. And so, the Bible then, though, for Peeper, pretty much is the Word of God. He's not, he doesn't deny the first two, but it's not that pressing for him. And this is a product of his situation, his time in history, things that are going on, and that's part of the situation. Now, so this is what Peeper's giving you, and that's what he's laying out for us, uh, his approach to this. So he's going to stress that the Word, the Bible, is this thing, and so it doesn't matter whether it's spoken or whether it's written, it's all cool, and so I can read the text, and it's powerful, and it's doing the same thing for me. This is very much Peeper's position, because he wants to elevate the power of the Bible itself, whereas... Prenter and Luther are kind of hitting from a different standpoint, and they're emphasizing much more the spoken aspect of it. And again, Peter's not denying that, but he wants to make sure we're not minimizing the Bible, partly because he sees the Bible under attack, and he's trying to save it. That's kind of what's going on here. And he is on the early days, the early stages, of what will develop into a full-blast kind of Lutheran fundamentalism with regard to the Bible. Okay? And you probably had this discussion a little bit in Lutheran mind, and it probably dismayed you greatly and really made you wonder what you're, in the world you're doing here at the seminary, learning all these stupid things, because it was much easier when you were young and uh, naive. But we're going to revisit it again before we're done here in the next few days. So for full clarity, when he says uh, spoken word of God, he's referring to actual reading of the Bible text out loud, not preaching. No, no, no. People would be, I mean, he would mean preaching. He would mean the, the moral proclamation. Yeah, he would mean that. That's what he's after. He's not denying that at all. Okay. All right. Okay, good. So off we go then. So the Word does its thing. And so now we get to the question for, um, for um, Peeper. We can talk about this a little bit. We're going to revisit this more when we get to sacraments. But the key with sacraments then is, what is a sacrament? And how do we define sacrament? Now, you should also have learned this somewhere along the way, that the reality is sacrament as a word doesn't specifically appear in the Bible. The closest you'll get is that Greek mysterion, which even exegetes will argue about whether that, what that really means and what it means, what we think it means. So sacrament means it's a word we're imposing, like Trinity and others, which doesn't make it bad. It just means that there's some fluidity here. So is there any one right definition for the word sacrament? And the answer is not really. Now, in the Lutheran tradition, whose definition have we picked up? Luther's. Not Luther's, even older than that. Where did Luther get his definition? Augustine. From Augustine or Augustine. We'll follow Harriman on this. Yeah, Augustine. I like Augustine. So, Augustine gives us the definition for sacrament, and his definition is you take the tangible thing, you add the Word of God to it, and bam, you got yourself a sacrament. That's roughly what the Latin translates into, um, roughly. And so you, add, you take the physical, tangible, material thing, add the Word of God to it, gives you a sacrament. So then from the Augustinian definition, we always have to have three things for a sacrament to be a sacrament. We have to have the di direct command of Christ. And I just, well, I'll get there. I'll put command of Christ second. So it has to be commanded by Christ. And so it has to be told to do it. Command by Christ, or we can just say God. Making, we can leave the Father as possibility in there. We have to have a um, promise of grace being delivered. And we have to have some kind of tangible, physical, material thing. So we have to have a material aspect. So these are the three things that you have to have for a sacrament to be a sacrament. But whose definition is this? It's Augustine's. It's not a scriptural definition. You can have a different definition of sacrament and come up with different answers to this, what's a sacrament. But going on this definition, we end up with how many sacraments? 
two and a half. <laughs> no, that's about right. And so this is what we come up with. So, because this, this is the threefold definition. So we start with baptism. Easy. Is baptism commanded by Christ? Yeah, go and baptize. All right. Is there a tangible material aspect to it? Yeah, you got water. Is there a promise of grace? Baptism now saves you with the washing of regeneration. Cool, got it. Lord's Supper, commanded by Christ? Yes. Tangible material? Obviously, promise of grace? Given for you for the forgiveness of sins? Got it. So what's my half? Absolution. Are we commanded by God to forgive sins? Yes. Is there a promise of grace attached when we forgive sins? There is. Is there a tangible material element? Yeah. The dude who stands there in front of you. Kind of counts. And so I would put absolution, and Melanchthon counts it as three. Luther counts it as three pretty frequently. So it's not a big deal. So we have perhaps as many as three sacraments. Maybe more. Well, maybe not. Or maybe. Well, Brian. In a, I, I think like contemporary in, in our in LCMS Lutheranism, like we, we get really hung up on the fact that absolution isn't a sacrament. You know, there's only two. And like to me, like uh, we we can agree on that, but there, ultimately that's not a big deal. It's, it's not a big deal. And in fact, because I, absolution forgives our sins. So exactly. Who cares and about the you're not. What are you gaining by making that argument? You're gaining nothing. If anything, you're diminishing absolution, and that's not cool. And so it's, it's not, you're not gaining anything by arguing for only two sacraments. It's, it's kind of a fool's argument. Like sort of it doesn't have the title, right? Well, I, I don't know. I, you can give it the title. I, I do. I, just, I, you know, I say it kind of facetiously. You know, we have two and a half sacraments. But no, I really do. I think absolution is right up there. And how much more real is having a pastor stick his head in your hand and say, I forgive you your sins. How real is that? That's pretty tangible. I mean, it's still a need of grace. Yeah, you bet it is. There's no question it's, it's grace is being delivered. And it's very specific. So, yeah, I would, I would say there's no problem with it. And probably the, one of the biggest reasons we're reluctant is because we don't practice private absolution anymore. We're not used to it. Um, but the more we get used to getting to the altar and get our sins forgiven, hand on my head, it starts to become a whole lot more real. And we start counting this as a sacrament. I think that has a, the biggest probably reason we don't consider it a sacrament is because of our practice. We've gotten away from private confession and absolution, which is always what Luther had in mind. We'll talk about that later, too, but keep in mind, in the small catechism, and any time you read Luther teaching you anything about confession and absolution, he always has in mind private, individual confession and absolution. He did not envision a general absolution. That's not what he's talking about, the small catechism. So when you read in the small catechism about the pastor forgiving your sins, it's not talking about the general confession. It's talking about private confession. It's just assumed. Kyle. Do you think in addition to um, our practice going astray, perhaps <coughs> one of the reasons that we don't view uh, the tangible material as being the pastor is kind of a Gnostic tendency not to think of people as belonging to... No, I would agree. It's a Gnosticism. We want to have the spiritual real thing and who are you anyway. And, it, and then hand in hand with that is a diminishing of the pastoral office where, <clears throat> well, who do you think you are anyway? You're just a dude. And we, we forget that pastors are pastors. Um, that's a systems four discussion, or whatever you'll call it when you come back. Um, but <clears throat> hopefully we'll teach it to you somewhere. Um, one would hope. <laughs> you can always watch it online. It's, gonna, it's available. Catch up what you don't get taught. Um, so you're right. It, we, we have this tendency to spiritualize. We want the real Jews. It's not some dude. Who do you think you are? So that's part of it. All right. So we've got our three sacraments. Now, Rome adds how many more? Four more. What else do they have on their list? They have marriage, extreme unction, which is last rites, the anointing with oil, ordination, or the rite of orders, ordination, and then the last one, confirmation. All right, so confirmation. So they have the four more sacraments. They have penance is what we would call absolution, but they have their whole rite of penance, or now they call it actually reconciliation, which is getting closer to where it should be. That's what they now call it. They don't call it penance anymore. Sacrament of Reconciliation. So that's there. But then they add to that marriage and holy orders and extreme unction and confirmation. Right. What I find out is for marriage, well, for marriage, ordination, confirmation, and extreme unction, they're all tied to, to getting the Eucharist. They are, but that's not so much the important thing because they would say that actually, I mean, they're all, the Eucharist is always tied into everything, right. But they're saying that the actual participation in these things is delivering grace. And that's where the, we get hung up. Now, if you want to just define sacrament as a rite of the church by which people are celebrating God's gifts, 
Oh, fine, we can open up the doors and have all kinds of things added to the list. But if you go with a tight definition like this one, then the other four get left out. I mean, marriage is commanded by Christ or God, sure. And you have a tangible element, yeah, you got a man and a woman, physical union, but then you have the promise of grace, and that's lacking. And as people point out, promise of children, that's not quite grace. Um, and so it's a little different. And there's no doubt about that. But the key here is, and see, this is why it's, not, it's really a stupid thing to say, well, the Catholics have seven sacraments. They're wrong. That's just dumb. You know, that's just dumb. Don't do that. Seven sacraments, so what? What's the big deal? And in fact, I'm hoping as you learn, go along in your education, you'll start to broaden your understanding of sacrament and get a little more free with it. Because sacrament is really the idea of taking God's intangible truth and making it concrete and real. And so when you start thinking this way, you start seeing a lot of things as, and we'll make an adjective out of it, or an adverb, sacramental. And not necessarily sacrament per se, according to the strict Augustinian definition, but sacramental, no doubt. And are there sacramental aspects to marriage? I think you could say, yeah, it's grounded in the concrete reality. God himself is working on it. He's promised it. And even his activity in it is is all over the place, there are sacramental aspects. And are there sacramental aspects to a man and a, you know, two guys, friends, just having a conversation about God's reality? There's something sacramental and tangible about these things. Even sacramental about enjoying a good beer, as Luther would almost hint at sometimes. You can make this kind of argument. Doesn't that stress the difference, or the, why we call things means of grace versus sacramental then? Well, sure. I'm saying that's a sacramental is the point. It's not a clear-cut, tangible, there you're getting forgiveness of sins through this, but there's something about this which makes us think of the sacraments or it has, makes us, puts us in mind of God's reality. So in a sense, I want you to think of sacramental a little more broadly than you're used to and not be so tightened down. This is not meant to diminish baptism and Lord's Supper. It's meant to help you realize the manifold ways that God is working to convey his reality to you. Okay? Brian. Would you say the sacraments then are things that are sacramental that are also means of grace? Um, sure. Yes, I can live with that. Yeah, no problem. All right. Now, the other thing we get into very quickly with Peeper is the problem of sacraments getting misused. And probably the biggest misuse is this idea of ex opere operato. And all of this stuff we're doing in Peeper, you probably should have encountered somewhere along the way when you're studying for your little systematics test you had to pass to get in here. All right. So ex opere operato means what? Literally, yeah, from the work having been worked. Or you could translate it more freely, from the deed having been done. That's ex opera operata. Now, we have a tendency to be really, bam, oh no, we don't believe in ex opera operata, it's not magic. So that's why you don't go down the parade route on the, on the St. Patrick's Day parade with your water cannon and spray the crowd while you're shouting over the speaker, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Shh. Would that be a true baptism? Yes! Ah! It would! It would! Water, word, real deal. Well, why don't we do that then? Because that would be ex opera operato. You're missing the whole point. So that's why we've got to come to terms with this thing a little bit. So we often dismiss this and we kind of disparage ex opera operato. Oh, yeah, that's just like, that's, that's, that's magic. All right? And we don't like that. We don't like the idea of kind of presto, say the magic words, and you're in like Flynn. And this is why we also get bothered when we hear the stories about the Catholic nuns baptizing every baby born at St. Mary's, which is probably true. Why not? Yeah, they would probably do it. And we hear about this, and we think, well, that's just, that's just magic. But if a Catholic nun baptizes a little baby at St. Mary's, is it a real baptism? You bet it is. So, is that child actually a baptized child of God? Yes. So everything's cool with that child. Well, not so fast. Because, you see, ex opera operato is actually speaking a true thing, isn't it? Does God always work whenever the sacrament is done? And the answer is yes, 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 yes. So this actually conveys an element of truth. And we're not actually discounting the efficacy of the sacraments. And that's where we have to make a clear distinction here. And now pay attention to the verbiage. This is important. The efficacy of the sacrament is never in question. An ex opera operato actually affirms the efficacy of a sacrament. 
when I do a sacrament, does it always work? And the answer is, always every time, because God has promised it. Not because I said the magic words the right way, because God has promised to work on this thing. So the efficacy is always attached to the promise of Christ, the promise that He will deliver the gospel. So it's done. You never have to wonder if it's happening. So the efficacy is one thing, but now there's another whole side to this. And the other whole side to the sacrament is there has to be not only the efficacy of the deed done, but there has to be faith to receive the benefit. And there's the key word I'm going to go here for the next part. So when you're thinking about sacraments, there are two things to think about. And I would say this even goes with the word proclaimed. The other word is benefit. Is the sacrament of any benefit? There's only one criteria that determines whether it's a benefit, and that is, is there faith to receive it? And if there is not faith to receive the sacrament, then it is of no benefit whatsoever, and it might even, in, ha in fact, be detrimental. Because you are taking the very gospel of God and treating it as, no small, as a small and different thing. This is the problem discussed by St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, where you've got people eating and drinking to their harm, Paul tells us. That's the idea. So, in other words, when a sacrament is rightly understood, and I'm going to broaden this out, when a means of grace is rightly understood, word preached, sacrament done, it's always efficacious. Is every time that you are preaching, is the Holy Spirit present in that proclamation? He is promised to be. If you're preaching it properly. That's right. So, the pre He is present. It's efficacious. It does stuff. But... There must be faith there to receive it, or it is of no benefit. So, why not baptize the whole audience at a parade? Would it be an efficacious baptism? Right. But would it be beneficial? Who knows? And in fact, we take the very beautiful thing of the sacrament, and we start treating it like it's candy. Literally. What do they do at parades? Throw out candy. Anybody who wants it can just grab it up. And we treat the Holy Sacrament of Baptism, like it's nothing more than candy, take it if you want it. And we're cheapening it. And I think this is exactly the right application of Christ's words of throwing pearls before swine. So why would you take your Sacrament of Baptism and throw it along the parade route? Don't do that. Don't cheapen this grace of God. And that's why we also don't stand at the Lord's Supper at the altar and say, Hey, you all come on up here. Got grace for everybody. No. This is for those who are ready to receive it in faith to their benefit. And so the benefit of, has to be there, so both aspects are in action. But don't just attack ex opera operato because, oh, that's like it's magic. Well, in a sense, it kind of is, because it always does what it's going to do. It's always going to deliver the goods. The question is, will it be received in faith? That's the thing to focus on, not the lack of ex opera operato. Brian. But don't we give baptism to anyone who wants it? Because there's no, I don't. I mean, but there, there's no aspect of condemnation. Right, but see, there's also the aspect, of, are you misleading people and throwing pearls before swine? So we'll talk about this more in baptism, but I'll just kind of whet your so appetite here. So you, you only give it to people who understand? No, not understand. Those, see, in other words, a baby doesn't understand, but I'll baptize a baby. The criteria is, for me is going to be, is the person who's being asked to be baptized or the mother who's bringing a child to be baptized, are they understanding baptism properly? And are they intending to raise this child in the faith? so that the benefit will be there, or are they treating this like a little magic act or a simple right of the church to get grandma off their back? And I have had people that have come to me and asked when I was a parish pastor, said, I want to baptize my kid. I would say, why? Because I got to appease the family and they're all on my back and just get this kid baptized so I'm going to get them all happy. I said, are you planning to raise this child in the faith? <laughs> no. I don't baptize him. Now, you've got different opinions on this. I know some of my colleagues, other men will say, I'll baptize anybody. Who am I to deny the grace of God? Well, I get that, but I would also counter by saying, great, so you've just fueled the wrong understanding, and now you think they've got their personal life insurance paid up, and they'll go their merry way. Have you helped or hurt them? And see, I would argue you've hurt them, because you've just fed into their false understanding of what it means to have faith or be baptized, and you're not helping them one bit. I mean, it's the same, it's the same like uh, holding sins or forgiving grace. Exactly. It's exactly. It's the office of the keys in action. And I would say, I'm not withholding grace from that child. The parent is. So I don't hold responsible, like, well, you denied faith to that child. No, the parent did. The parent has denied this. The parent is not doing their job. I'm not. 
I'm not accountable for that. In fact, I'm accountable for rightly using the means of grace. And what I bap if I would baptize that child, I would contend, contend yeah, I'm throwing pearls before a swine. Now you might say, who knows what God might do? Maybe that action will bring that family in. Maybe. And you can make that argument. So there is some room for some wiggle on this. But that would be my practice. And I think it's worth considering. All right, next up. Uh, kind of same, same, along the same lines, but instead of an infant, an adult comes to you requesting baptism, but they're doing it for that exact same reason. Yeah, Because yeah. their grandmother said, yeah. oh, this is ridiculous. You haven't been baptized yet. You need to go yeah, get baptized. Yeah, so give me a baptize, and you say, what do you believe about Jesus? I don't know. What do you mean? No, you don't baptize. Of course not. Julian. Do we do the same thing with corporate confession and absolution? In which case, there is no actually ever withholding of the grace. It's always... Well, that raises a whole other discussion, doesn't it? And there are some liturgies that actually do have that withholding. Um, and that raises some, you know, rather virulent discussions online about what's really an absolution. But the well, chemist actually had a couple where he'd say, I therefore announce to all of you who are repentant, you are forgiven. And if you're not repentant and you're holding sin in your heart, you are damned. Uh, in so many words. I have no... Well, see, Brian, frankly, I don't have a problem. I've done it. I've done it. And so I don't have a problem with it. But is it really an absolution? Probably not. But is it speaking God's truth? I think it is. So, <laughs> Julian. Oh, oh you want to no, go ahead? I mean, just, oh, no, just kind of okay. the issue of yeah, just people just coming in and not even... Right. And see, this is, this is the trade-off between pure... Bro so in other words, in an absolution, is it an efficacious de declaration of forgiveness of sins? Are sins really being forgiven? Right. But if I'm actually an unbeliever or harboring sin in my heart, is it beneficial to me? It's not. I don't have faith to receive it. And see, so that's why I'm saying this, this holds not only for sacraments, but it holds for the Word as well. The proclamation of the Word is the exact same thing. It's efficacious. You bet it is. But is it beneficial? Well, that depends. Same thing holds here. Jess? So I could see someone saying, well, we want to baptize them even if they're not believing yet because then God can work through the baptism and the Holy Spirit can work. It seems to be using baptism as kind of magic. Uh, and so as we get them baptized, okay, now they're okay. It denies the Holy Spirit's work in the rest of the person's life. Correct. Through the proclamation of the word, through anything else. Correct. Especially in the case of an adult. Exactly. Yes. Because there are multiple means of grace, and we need to pay attention to all these, and there's more to Christianity than just doing sacraments to people. There's the whole idea of being conformed to Christ and all that sort of stuff, which we get into later in the quarter. All right. Good. Who's up next? Let's go quickly here, because we've got a lot to do today. Luke. There's the benefits of the means of grace. You're actually dividing uh, the benefit of faith into two different categories. You're How's saying that? faith can only be received through the, the word, but cannot faith cannot be received through baptism. No, no, I, I, did not, the, I didn't, the, didn't say that. I didn't, no, 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 no. I didn't say that. So I'm saying it's efficacious. It's always delivering the goods. But the faith does need to be there to sustain this. And we'll talk more about this in baptism. But if faith is already there, then you're not creating faith with baptism or the, or the Lord's Supper. I'm postponing that to baptism. Because we, we've got too much to do today, and we'll get back to it with that with sacraments. Brian. I, I can see people saying, well, I want to err on the side of grace. I want to sin boldly. I yeah, 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 yeah. Like, why, what, what would you say to that? I would say, cool, go for it, dude. So it's just a matter of opinion? <laughs> it kind of is. I mean, you know, if, if that's where you're at, great. But I'm going to make my case, and I'll try to argue for you. Why would you throw pearls before swine? Why aren't you listening to the Lord's whole counsel? You know, you want to be a grace guy, oh, that's fun, that's all touchy-feely, but are you really helping that lady? Are you really helping that child? Or are you just sending them off with a nice pat on the back and a little rub on the head? Oh, go have a happy life, see you when you die, or see you at confirmation time maybe, if you're really lucky, hope, hope so. You won't see them anymore. You won't, exactly. And so are you really helping them? And see, I'm going to make the case, let's be a little more honest about what we're doing. And I would say I've got some church fathers on my side on this one. And so it's not just a matter of, I'm going to err on the side of the gospel. No, let's err on the side of God's whole truth, which is the gospel. So, and see, I would make also the further argument, you're not really promoting the gospel when you mislead somebody into false understandings of their standing before God. That's not the gospel. That's touchy-feely sentiment. And there's a big difference. In, there's a big difference between sentiment and gospel. But frankly, in 2017 in the church, there's not much difference. We look at sentiment, touchy-feely, good feelings. That's gospel. Baloney. It's not. But we, we equate it. And so, so many times you hear people say, err on the side of the gospel. What they really mean is, err on the side of sentiment. And you need to make the, make the distinction. All right, who's up? Kyle? Adam? Go ahead. Okay, quick, so quick, quick. Through all of these other things, I forgot what you actually said about my question, but you said essentially that you would, 
you would put the whole benefit thing um, with preaching too. Yes, yes, yes. So we shouldn't preach to people who don't want it. No, you, you. Well, there's some truth to that. Yeah, I mean, if you got people who are resistant, what does Jesus say? Kick off the dust from your feet on your way. That's what he says. And this, and this is right. This is why you don't preach on the street corner and just yell at people. Is that really beneficial? They heard the word of God. Yeah. Spare me. And you, what's your reaction to that? Positive or negative? So are you, really, are you serving the gospel or are you really undercutting it? And see, it's back to this baptism. Are you really serving the gospel or are you actually diminishing it? So there's something to be, I think this dynamic needs to be much more carefully considered. So I can preach, I preach the word of God. Great. Was it efficacious? You bet. Was it beneficial? Well, who cares? Well, you need to care. This is relevant. Okay? Go ahead. When there's people sitting there that don't want to be there, do you just preach? You mean in church? Wow, that's a different kind of animal, you know, oh, cool. because, the, because you've, got a whole, no, you've got a whole congregation of people. So you've got some people there who are ready to hear. You've got other teenagers who are bored out of their skull and can't wait for it to be over with. So what do you do? You preach to the whole council, you know, and you deal with it. But if you've got one room full of teenagers, probably instead of just preaching at them, you probably shock them into some reality first and try to get their attention so it be, actually becomes beneficial. That's just, now we're into rhetoric and preaching and the problems of getting your audience. So I basically had the same question, but is the difference between why you maybe um, preach um, as opposed to withholding it and why you don't do the sacraments? Because when you preach, you can give the whole counsel of God as people need it, whereas the sacraments are just pure grace. Now, there's some truth to that, because good preaching, I can just lay law on people when they need to hear it. So maybe I'll start with my people who are bored to tears of shame on you. Here's God for you. And what are you doing? Are you really going to diss your Lord that, like that? Who do you think you are? And so I make him feel pretty lousy first. Yeah. And it's easy to do to seventh graders. He just, oh, I'm sorry. Good, you should be. You rotten little kid. Yeah. So, so you preach the law. So I, I agree with that. All right. <clears throat> Good. All right. We'll fly forward then. Now, don't miss, though. This is key from the um, small called articles. When Luther is laying out how God delivers his gospel to us, this is the very bottom of 114, and so we have Luther writing, The gospel not merely in one way gives us counsel and aid against sin, for God is super abundantly rich and liberal in his grace and goodness. First through the spoken word, by which the forgiveness of sins is preached in the whole world. He means preaching from the pulpit which is the peculiar office of the gospel. He means pastors. Secondly, through baptism. Now, he's not eliminating others, but the pastor's key here. Secondly, through baptism. Thirdly, through the sacrament of the altar. Fourthly, what? Fourthly? Through the power of the keys and also through the mutual conversation and consolation of brethren. This is not to be diminished. In my opinion, I think Luther is enumerating these ways. And that last one, mutual conversation and conversation with brethren, he's not talking about, talking about the cardinals over donuts and coffee after church. He's talking about a brother in the faith admonishing and encouraging and forgiving another brother. That's what he's talking about. So the mutual conversation and consolation is actually doing the gospel among the laity. Is that a means of grace? How about that? I think it is. So you see, that's what I mean. You've got you to open your mind here a little bit and stretch a little bit because Luther's willing to have a little more going on here than these neat little things we like to have sometimes. Right. I, I know uh, in, the, in this, Heber talks about Luther saying, well, Luther is A-OK -okay with individual Christians forgiving, uh, saying, I, I as, a, as a servant, um, forgive you all of your sins in the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, I know... Some, some people will say that's the pastor's office yeah, to yeah. do that. And yet Luther here is saying uh, anyone can do that. Yes. And I, I know other people say, well, if people don't feel really forgiven by that, they can go to the pastor. But um, individuals cannot, uh, because the pastor's called to his office, can't do, shouldn't, shouldn't do baptism and um, the Eucharist. They shouldn't consecrate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what do we do here when we say, well, Luther is saying, Brothers in Christ can forgive each other's sins. Systems four. All right, let's move on. <laughs> no, it, no, it's, that's just, that's all we got. All you're dealing with questions of church and ministry, pastors, priesthood of believers, all that stuff. That's all systems four. We unpack that. Quick answer is really simple. God has means of grace. Who has the means of grace? The church. Who's the church? 
pastors and people together. Who has the keys? Both. So both are doing the means as is appropriate to both. They're not the same. People and pastors have different ways of doing them, but they're both using the means of grace. So can people forgive sins? Yeah, that's the mutual conversation and consolation of brethren. Is that only pastors can? No, that's clericalism. That's stupid. It's wrong. Are there else people who think that? Yep, they're wrong. Okay? Is it also wrong to say, pastors are no big deal, they're just like everybody else? No, that's also wrong. That's called rank congregationalism. Are there also some people who believe that? Yes, they're also stupid and wrong. Okay? So the reality is, pastors are pretty special. People, lay people also have the keys. It's all going on. Systems four. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. All right, but you never get to take it. All right, good. Yeah, never again. It's gone. All right. Good. Now, the next part of this, obviously, is where he starts getting into the problems, and he goes after the Roman Catholic problems and then the Reformed problems. And the bottom line is this. In Roman Catholicism, they have a tendency to diminish the faith aspect and focus entirely on the efficacious aspect, okay? And that's part of the downfalls. But there's an even greater problem. The greater problem with Rome is our understanding of what in the world do you mean by grace anyway, all right? Now, for us, we have been well-trained. We know that grace is the favor dei propter Christum, right? Remember that? If you didn't have me last quarter, you need to know your Latin now. So the favor dei propter Christum, everybody should know this because it's simple Latin, and it simply means the grace or the favor, the kindness of God on account of Christ. Pretty simple. So favor dei propter Christum, and the point of favor or de propter Christum is grace happens in God, not in you. In other words, God changes his mind about you. Instead of seeing you as a sinner fit for hell, he sees you in Christ. Now you're his forgiven child. So grace is the favor of God on account of Christ. That's not how Rome typically defines it. Rome typically defines grace as virtually a commodity, or you might even call it Salvation fuel. And so, grace is the stuff that helps you live the way you should live. And he shoots it into you when you need it to help you do what you need to do. So you get little shots of grace along the way, and it infuses you. And they even use the language, gratia infusa, which is grace infused. And now that I've got some grace infused, off I go. And so the whole sacramental system is based on this. So at baptism, I get a good shot. Is it enough for my whole life? Probably not. Because if you sin, you're going to need some new grace coming. And so, when I go to the Eucharist, do I get grace? Yep. How much? I don't know, about a week's worth, or maybe a day's worth. You know, enough to get you to the next time you get to the Eucharist. Just enough. If I go to the Sacrament of Reconciliation and confess my sins and receive forgiveness, how many sins get forgiven? The ones I enumerate. What about the ones I commit tomorrow? Ha! <laughs> Sorry, come back again. So you're always getting just enough. Just enough. Just enough. It's always piecemeal. And so you have grace then is very differently understood. That's the biggest issue. For us, when grace is delivered, it's always the favor of God. It's the whole thing. Big deal. Difference. All right. So that's the problem with the Roman Catholic view. What's the problem with the Reformed understanding of the sacraments? And where does people go for this attack when he's going to try to undo the Calvinist view? What's the big problem? The grace is <clears throat> that's the big problem. You have a limited atonement. Remember the L in tulip Calvinism? The L is limited atonement. So that means when Jesus died, for whom did he die? Only the elect. So, if Jesus only died for the elect, can a Calvinist pastor ever look at a person and say, Jesus Christ died for you? I don't get to do that. I can only say, Jesus Christ died for you if you're fortunate enough to be one of the elect. Well, then the guy's next question obviously will be, am I? And the answer to that is, we'll find out on the last day, won't we? Exactly. And see, this is the best you can get. And so, in reality, if I'm a real, consistent, full-blown Calvinist, are, is there anything such thing as a means of grace? Not really. And if I am one of the elect, why do I need a means of grace anyway? Is God going to make sure I'm in? He has to. So who needs means of grace? I'm just, I'm in because he already chose me. So what's the means of grace? It's kind of just perfunctory. And then you start seeing, well, how do typical Reformed and Calvinists kind of handle the sacraments? What's their attitude? And it becomes kind of a superficial, not a big deal. And so you see, theology sometimes influences practice. We know lex orandi, lex credendi, practice shapes your theology, but it works the other way too. So if I have a crummy view of the sacrament, 
I have a very crummy practice of it. This is illustrated clearly. Um, years ago, I had a grad student friend who was Assemblies of God who came here to do his, his PhD because Assemblies don't believe in that kind of stuff. So if you want to do an advanced degree, you have to go to some other institution because Assemblies of God don't have those things, those kinds of things. So he was here doing a PhD, and before he was done with his PhD, he became, he became a Lutheran. Surprise, surprise. Um, but what put him over the top was when he was at his Assemblies of God church on a Sunday morning, and they were doing the sacrament, passing it up and down the aisles, and they were a little short on time that day, so they were doing general announcements while the sacrament was being passed around during the church service at the tail end. And he said, that just did him in. Uh, he, he just couldn't deal with it because he realized what a crummy view they had of the sacrament and they're treating this like it's nothing. But see, for them, it is nothing. It's just kind of, you know, your little God moment, but big deal. For us, it's everything. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just going to talk about the, the difference. Because, so obviously, uh, you know, we say that, you know, Calvinists, they can't really proclaim the gospel, but in actuality, do they? I mean, so I'm wondering if there's a discrepancy between how we're like logically describing this, if they're consistent, sure. versus how they would actually describe and it. And this is one of Pieper's most famous phrases, and you probably have heard this already somewhere along the way, and he talks about it in your reading today. <clears throat> the, you need to learn this one. You're not a good LCMS pastor if you don't know this. The felicitous inconsistency. Every LCMS pastor learns, if you learn anything from Pieper, you learn this. So today is the day you learn this. Put it into your lexicon and memorize it. A felicitous inconsistency. This is English, in case you didn't recognize it. All right? <laughs> so this is a felicitous inconsistency, and this is a U here, by the way, okay? So a felicitous, felicity means what? Happiness. Nice. That's good. And an inconsistency, you know what that is. So a felicitous inconsistency is, good thing they're not being consistent with themselves. This is a happy thing. So when a, when a Reformed person actually does the means of grace, that's good. They're being inconsistent with their own doctrine, but I'm glad they are. Brian? Doesn't people say that when, when they try and proclaim the gospel and say uh, the whole elect thing and, and pe people have to deal with sorrow and stuff, they actually just turn to God's... They, in the, in the, in the la this is why Luther makes the argument and Pieper makes the argument. In the last analysis, everybody on his death or deathbed becomes a Lutheran because you turn to the solid Word of God and you quit looking inside yourself because there's no hope there and you have nowhere else to look but to Christ. And so on your deathbed, we're all, we're all Lutheran. This is his argument. And he has stories he likes to tell about people who had these deathbed conversions and stuff. Yeah, Pieper does. He likes to tell those stories. All right, top of 132. This is quiz questions. Don't miss this. Too late. All right, first full paragraph. The gratia infusa in its good sense. Ding, 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 ding. As true Christian sanctification or holy living is, of course, also intended to be a signum et testimonium of divine grace, a sign and testimony. But the gratia infuso is always imperfect. It does not stand the test before man's conscience or the revealed law of God. So, in other words, gratia infusa is appropriate because grace is the favor dei propter Christum, but grace is also the gift of God in you that enables you to do what God gives you to do. And we talk about this as grace being gratia and donum. That was also last quarter, if you had me. We talked about that. You remember, okay? So there is also this donum aspect, this gift, where it's in me, and now I can live this Christian life. And he does infuse me with grace. And the, the reason we talk both ways on this is because the Bible does. The Bible will talk about the grace of God being God's forgiveness, and the Bible will talk about God's grace being present in you to live the way God wants you to live. It's both things. Yeah, Brian. So when you talk about grace being a gift... Is there like a substance idea attached to that where it's something that you physically like you receive? <coughs> that's, that's what I'm kind of struggling with in terms of we talk with grace because it sounds like a lot of we speak of it as a substance yeah. that you get. And it's almost, but see, it's, it's kind of has more to do with that, you know, Christ within me, the Holy Spirit, that mystical union thing, that theosis kind of idea, that deification, being like Christ. <clears throat> that's really more the idea. And is that tangible and real? Well, it is. And see, now here's where the sacraments, which grace are they delivering? Especially Lord's Supper, which one is it delivering? Exactly, exactly. <clears throat> I have received the forgiveness of sins, well, that's what we tend to emphasize, but I'm also getting power for my Christian life and strength for living and following Him. Oh yeah. And the Lord's Supper especially points to this. And there's a reference somewhere in here, I think, in Pieper. We talk about how often baptism is seen as the entrance into the Christian faith. And then the Lord's Supper is the sustenance to keep you going. So a little bit like birth and then feeding. So the Lord's Supper is like lembus. You know, it's the way bread that keeps you going on the, on the journey. All you token people. Hit those whenever I can. All right. <clears throat> okay. 
Good? All right. Yes? Did you say, uh, is that, so is that a good view or a bad view? Which one? It's a good view. It's a good view. Because the sacrament, it's all the same grace. But this, this is especially what the Lord's Supper does, is it sustains us and helps us to do it. It doesn't discount this, but it also in, takes into account the idea that grace is enabling me to live the way God intends me to live. It's both things. Adam. Uh, Peter talks about the sacraments uh, strengthening your, your faith. Would you poo-poo upon that? Phrase? No, 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 no. I'm fine with that. You know, the idea that he, he's, he's in, in, encouraging me, helping it grow stronger. And we're talking here about faith, not so much the faith that grabs on to Jesus as much as the faith as my lived out practice of the Christian life. But it, you could even say it's the first part, too, because you see it's being reinforced one more time, which is one of the reasons why you get yourself to the sacrament on a regular basis, because when it's not sustained, faith doesn't endure. And this is, why, see, this is always the question. So you baptize a baby, and he's, ba and he's got grace, right? Yeah. Well, how long? So I baptize the mother who come, the baptize the baby of the mother who comes in, baptize my kid, and she never darkens another door of the church, never mentions Jesus, wants that child, never prays that child. How long will the faith last? Well, who knows? But is that faith going to still be there when the kid is in first grade and has never heard Christ mentioned? I would say no. No. Somewhere the faith just atrophies and dies if it's not sustained. So the means of grace sustain the faith to keep it living. So the, even your faith that grabs onto Christ and receives his gift has to be sustained. That's why it doesn't work to say at a funeral, well, this dude was baptized and um, we know he received the sacrament eight years ago when he was in church one time. So, yay, he's a saved believer. Give me a break. You know, everybody knows the stories about the dude, how what he was doing a living. And nobody wants to say he was apart from God's grace, but all evidence says we should say that. So, you know, I don't think just because somebody's baptized, you preach them into heaven, in other words. But that's a peace stuff question. All right, Luke. For gratia and fusia, in the good sense you're talking about here, would you say that's, in a certain sense, synonymous with living a sanctified life or having a sanctified life? It's, that's where people's going with it. Yeah, that's the idea. So, in other words, it's, it's the grace in action in your life. And we're going to get that later in the next course. We're not doing that today. All right, great, great parting quote on the bottom of 140 from Luther's hand. And this great Luther quote, If God were to bid you, this is about the last 12 lines, If God were to bid you pick up a straw or strip a feather, and with it command, order, and promise that through this act you should have forgiveness of all your sins, grace, and everlasting life, should you not accept that with great pleasure and gratitude, love it, praise it, and esteem that straw or feather a higher and holier possession than heaven and earth? For however insignificant the straw or feather is, by it you get so precious a gift as neither heaven nor earth nor all the angels can give you. Why are we such shameful folk that we do not esteem the water of baptism, the bread and wine which is Christ's body and blood, the spoken word, and the laying on of hands for the forgiveness of sins, there you have it, to be as precious and sacred a thing as we would hold such a straw or feather to be? For in these things, as we see in here, God himself wills to work, and they are to be his water, word, hand, bread, and wine, whereby it is his will to sanctify and save us in Christ, who has obtained the salvation for us and sent his Holy Spirit from the Father to apply this to us. Isn't that cool? So what he's saying is, quit looking down your nose at baptism. It's just water, or at the bread and wine. And this is exactly the move that the Anabaptists and the Sacramentarians, the Reformed do, or the Evangelicals do. Well, what's that? It's just an empty symbol. What do you mean? God is attached to this, his highest gifts. Who are you to look down on what God has given you? You think you know better than God? You're more spiritual than God is? What's wrong with you? Why are you discounting what God wants? Stop being a Platonist and embrace what God gives you where he gives it to you. That's what Luther's saying. This is pretty cool. All right. <clears throat> Good. And... So then we jump ahead to the last part, and I don't think there's really anything I wanted to highlight to you in 183 and following. Um, the intervening pages, Luke Pieper gets um, two realms all wrong, but that's not today's discussion, so we'll do that another time. All right. Anything else from Pieper? Oh, he does. Pieper doesn't know what he's doing on two realms, but that's another discussion for another day. Okay. Anything else? Good. Go to printer. 70 pages. Wow. What did you think of these 70 pages of printer? Not fun. No, not fun. And it's not because of the Latin. You can't, that's not the excuse. The problem is he is presenting ideas to you which are just blowing your mind. And if you're really thinking about it, he is, he is really saying some tough things. All right? Isn't he? All right? 
some incorrect things. Like what, Brian? What like, bothered you? Like what? Uh, Jesus Christ only appears to us in his humanity, and uh, the written word is only the law. All right. So the written word is only the law. You didn't like that, and Jesus appears to us only as humanity. And Peter uh, kind of contradicts him. Oh, yeah, Peeper kind of contradicts him. In fact, um, I would say, even though Peeper is never named by Prenter, Peeper and his like are clearly in mind in Prenter. Okay? And where Prenter is thinking about Peeper is when he uses the phrase, an orthodox doctrine of the verbal inspiration. He's got Peeper in mind. So, that's what we've got to deal with today. And this is not going to be a simple task, so we've got to get into this. All right. Let's see, where's my little spray bottle? There it is. <sighs> All right, so what else did stood out to you in this not easy reading from Prenter? Go ahead, Alex. Well, I have here uh, page 166. It says, but the Spirit which is manifested in the Word is manifested in the Word and sacrament. Therefore, it is not possible to make the Word and the sacrament human properties. The Word and the sacrament do not guarantee the presence of the Spirit. Right. Ouch. Yeah, they ouch. Carry, they do not carry the Spirit. It is, however, the Spirit that carries the Word in the sacrament. It is the Spirit that makes the Word. Yeah, that's right. Because see, and so Prenner is up to some interesting stuff in here. And this is one of these kinds of readings where if you take one part and stop, you're in right. trouble. Okay? And you've got to try to resolve this. Now, some of this stuff we're going to be able to resolve because we're going to set up the tensions and it's going to work. But... Some of it is not going to be so simply resolved. And his slam of the orthodox doctrine of verbal inspiration is not one of the things we're going to easily slide out of. He, he's making a strong challenge there. But the other things we can kind of work around. So let's get into this thing and see if we can kind of pick this apart and make sense of it quickly because we are tight on time here. Now, one of his first moves he makes is he starts talking about two different things. He talks about the inward word and he talks about the outward word. And this is where he starts. And he's going to basically follow this duality through the whole thing. And I'm using the word duality carefully because a duality is not a dualism. We're not talking about a fight between these. We're not talking about a mutually contradictory. We're not talking about a polarity. And most of you have been trained to think that Lutheranism is full of polarities and dualisms. That they're always battling against each other. That's the wrong way to think about it. The better way to think about it is we have these twofold realities that always kind of hang out side by side and are doing different things, but are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but complementary. And if you can get that hurdle behind you, things are much easier for you going forward. But if you're always thinking in terms of conflict, positive, negative, which one's right, which one's winning, you're always going to get messed up. This is true in law gospel. It's true in two kinds of righteousness, it's true in two realms, and it's true here with inward and outward word. If you set these in opposition, you're going to be all messed up. If you set them in a complementary relationship, now you can start sorting out what's going on. All right, now what does Prenter mean by the inward word? What's he after here? This contrition. All right, the Holy Spirit bringing Christ to me. And so it's very personal. It's very much, it's happened. It's me. I'm believing. And the outcome of this is faith to receive. All right? And this is faith like I had just written right about over here before. Okay? Faith as in the benefits. That's what's going on here. So what's the outward word? The actual words themselves, scripture. All right. This is the tangible, you can say text, or we can even say sacrament, which is exterior. And it's concrete. And it can be measured and evaluated. And this is to be associated with the efficacy. All right. Now, he's not making it nearly so simple for you, but that's really what's going on here. And so, what he's saying is, these two are both at work. If we only go for the outward word, we make a mistake because we start to act like this is sort of magic words or just hand somebody the Bible and they can read it and figure it out. And we limit it because we 
take out the faith personal aspect of God working it in me. But see, now when we emphasize this, we start to sound like we're a bunch of enthusiasts. Like, feeling the Holy Spirit moving in my guts? Is that what makes it real? And we freak out about that. And Prenter even says things like, the outward word becomes the inner word when somebody receives in a faith. And we go, ding, 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 all of our alarms go off and we think we're hearing, boop, 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 Pentecostal, ah! You know, Schwermerai, enthusiast, oh no. But what Prenter's getting at is, both of these aspects have to be going. And so then Prenter starts making his case, and which one does he seem to be much more interested in? Inward word or outward word? He's over here. He is emphasizing this. Now, one of the reasons why is he believes his context is busy emphasizing this. Okay? And if you would read Peeper, which one does he tend to be more interested in? This. Exactly. So what Prenter is trying to do is he's trying to be a counterbalance to what he sees as abuses going too far here, and he wants to bring it back over here, and he's reminding all of us that didn't Luther say that the Holy Spirit has to work faith in you, that it's an inward experience of the Spirit, that God does these things, so it's absolutely in me, and yet that's never cut off from the actions of the outward word. That's what Prenter's doing here in these early pages, okay? You tracking with this? So on page 106, he says, this is the very top of the page, about four lines in, in order to understand Luther, it is necessary to be assured that a genuine tension exists between the two tendencies, one that cannot be glossed over. This is really the very same tension which we found when we discussed the idea of grace and gift, a relationship between spirit and faith, namely the tension between the theology of predestination and redemption. And that's Prenter's language for the crux teologorum. You remember that whole problem from last quarter. So is a person saved only by God's work, or do you have to make a decision? And you're lost because of your choice to reject, but you're saved only because of God's choice. Well, how do you resolve those? You don't. And so what Prender's saying is the same truth applies here. You've got two things going here. The outward word, which seems very neat and clean, does God always work when his word is proclaimed? Right. But then how come not everybody's saved? Because not everybody receives any faith. Well, why not if it's really efficacious? What's going wrong here? So maybe it's not really efficacious. Well, no, it always is. But wait, how come not everybody gets into faith? Well, because faith is the determinant of it. Oh, so then it's really up to me. Oh, no, no, no. It's up to the Word of God coming to you. You don't get to choose. So you see, we're back to that tension again, and you're not going to resolve this. So what Prender is saying is, make sure you're emphasizing this, but make sure you're also emphasizing this. It's a live dynamic between these two things. That's what he's up to here. Is this making sense? All right, good. So, good. So, um, yeah. I'm trying, I want to be judicious here because we can get hung up on details and get really messed up. Um, go to page 109. This is pretty cool. Well, wait, first on page 108. And I think it's where he's trying to make this case then. So I'm second line down. When faith is faith in Christ... It contains, as we have previously seen, a constant motion, the motion away from ourselves to Christ. See, the problem with this is, this can become very much centered on me. I can manipulate the word. I can control it. I can be on, in charge of it. Over here, I'm not in charge of this. This is the Holy Spirit's dealings, and it moves me outside of myself. So this can become very inward focused, and this can become the problem of, this is God just kind of doing his thing. So he gives us this. So we're kind of trying to, trying to avoid this problem. Now over on page 109, this is the end of the very first paragraph. He writes, Christ is the ladder to heaven by which we alone have entrance to the Father. Well, so we're going to climb up Christ? Uh-uh. Christ comes down. He is not found in the heaven where the commentators seek him in flighty speculations. He is in the manger and in the bosom of the woman. We must start from below and not from above. Christ, or rather the humanity of Christ, is the sign by which God will draw us to himself. Therefore, the eyes must be directed toward this sign, not toward mere speculations. Good. All right. So Christ is present concretely, tangibly, here in the outward word. And so the outward word is the way that God is present for us right here, right now. Okay? So doesn't this contradict the whole, I mean, climbing the ladder up instead of God coming down? No, 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 because you see, this ladder is not the ladder that you're going to climb the rungs. It's the ladder by which God's Spirit comes down to you. So in other words, it's a downward aimed ladder, not one aimed upward. It, the ladder, he uses the word ladder because it bridges the gap. 
but it doesn't bridge the gap by giving you a way to get up. It bridges the gap by giving Christ a way to come into our world. It's a downward esc. It's a down escalator. But it's the ladder by which we alone have entrance to the Father. Well, yeah. You don't get hung up on parsing his language. No. It's clear what he intends by this. It's clear what he intends. All right. Now, for printer then, what's more important? Oral proclamation or words on a page? Oral proclamation. See, and his problem is, he is concerned is, when you start emphasizing words on a page, you start moving too much in this direction. And he wants us never to lose sight of this aspect of the living dynamic, here's the Holy Spirit preached into my ears, and it's actually happening. And he's concerned that if we over-intellectualize this or rationalize this, we get into trouble. Because when we rationalize it, we're trying to get control over it and have it neat and clean. So I preach like this, I'm going to get believers, and I'm going to have this kind of result. It's not that neat and clean. The Holy Spirit works. It's, it's stuff that we can't control. So it's God's. So God does it, and we don't get to control it. He's in charge, and we simply receive what He gives. That's the emphasis over here. And Prenner wants to make sure we don't lose sight of this. And his complaint is that when we start emphasizing this magic book of the Bible with this doctrine of inspiration, we start moving too much in this direction and we forget about this reality. This is what he's concerned about. And so that's why he does go after this, he calls rationalized doctrine of the verbal inspiration. He doesn't like it. That is not a compliment. And sometimes in here too he talks about orthodox Lutheranism. That's not a compliment from Prenter. He has in mind here people who are working too hard to explain too much and are moving into a kind of literalistic movement towards the outward word only and losing the reality of Christ present for us in the Holy Spirit. This is what he's concerned about. Now we can say, ooh, I think you're moving too far, printer. Maybe he is. And maybe he makes you nervous. Okay, but you've got to hear the point he's trying to make, that we are making a mistake when we over-rationalize and try to make this all neat and clean. That's, that's really what he's getting at here. All right, um, page 136 then. Well, let's, before I move there, let's go to 123. 123 first, okay. Um, about six lines down, the sacramental word of Christ is the gospel, a word which gives that about which it tells. And as gospel that fills its adequate form in the living word, the oral and proclaimed word in the church. If a written word, example the Bible word, becomes gospel, it is only because it borrows in a sense the form of the living word, Holy Spirit, and is accepted by the reader as a word in which the pages of the Bible, the risen Christ personally speaks to him. Therefore, Luther says that the gospel is really not a written word, but an oral word. But this living word, which is the instrument of the Spirit in his work of reconciling Christ, is in its content identical with the written word. For the risen Christ is himself identical with the historical Jesus. You see, you can't pull them apart. We're not going to leave the historic Jesus behind and go off into some kind of spiritual encounter. And we're not going to leave the written word behind and run off into our hearts and find some kind of Jesus connection. They belong together. But neither can we whack off the Holy Spirit's working and treat the Word like it's some kind of mere magic, read the book and everything's cool. And that's the problem of what we'll call Biblicism. So you try, start treating the book like it's the magic book, and we have this reverence for the book. You know, these words are God's words. They kind of glow off the page. And we start treating the Bible like it's some kind of power in itself, even though it is, but it's not that apart from faith of the Holy Spirit working to receive it. You getting this tension? All right. Now, the, in, the interesting thing is tensions are always tensions. And if enthusiast and charismatic Pentecostals try to go over here, we have a tendency to go over here. And that's why Prenner's working so hard to bring the balance back by criti being critical of just this kind of emphasis. All right. Good? All right. Now we move onward here then. Go to page 136 where I was heading you before, before I noticed something along the way. Oh, there's so much. Oh, and this, he keeps on using this phrase, verbum vocale, the Latin, all the time. What does that mean? Vocalized word, the spoken word. The, or, the spoken word is what it means. So the spoken word, in other words, he's emphasizing the oral aspect. Okay, so we go to page 136. Um, so Luther, he says, this is very bottom of the page, has never attacked scholasticism for being a form of theology which connected worship with outward things. See, the outward things are good. 
The outward things aren't a problem. He's fine with the outward things. So when Luther's going after scholasticism, it's not because you're trusting outward things. No, it's because you're forgetting the faith that needs to be there. That's the problem with scholasticism. So don't overcorrect by dissing the Bible or dissing the outward word. That's an overcorrection in the wrong direction. The better is to hold them both together. Brian. I guess my problem is like people can come to faith by reading the Bible. And they're strengthened by reading the Bible. <coughs> True. And but he I mean, he goes the complete opposite way and says the written word really isn't anything. Uh, he, he, he can be heard to say that. And I think if you sat but, printer but down... But he says it's just the law, and it isn't. <coughs> well, it isn't. all right. This is another part of printer, which we're not going to do today. But we will do it before we're done. And when we, get to the, when we get to the Christian life, and we go back and read the pages you didn't read yet on what he calls empirical piety and living the Christian life, we'll do with printer. But you're right. Printer is a law gospel reductionist. He has only a negative view of the law. You said he's so... Like, he's so... <coughs> He's kind of he's against like putting too much faith in outward things, um, but then he says like it's only preaching, which is outward. Like it's only. No, I agree. Even the even the oral proclamation is outward, and that's why. So he, in other words, he's not dissing that. That's why you have to hear him carefully. What he's what he's attacking is this. The, what he's attacking is the kind of the beginning stages of fundamentalism, where we think we got God all figured out, boxed up, it's just this, this way, and it's all neat and clean. And he's trying to remind us, no, it's not all neat and clean. And don't think you're in control of it. So the problem with this rationalizing is it always puts man in control. And one of the words he's going to use later is there's a tendency here to anthropo anthropomorphize things. So it's an anthrop uh, you know, anthropocentric. That's what I'm looking for. It's an anthropocentric thing, whereas this is the theocentric side. Now, again, it's a tendency. It's not a cut and dried, well, that means that it's bad and that's good. And you can hear that. But, and that's part of what he's trying to remind us of. But this does lead to this kind of anthropocentrism. Make a kind of clean cut, cut and dry, this is how it is to argument? Yeah, I will agree. And I will fault Prenter for that. But now I'll give him, I will give him a pass when I put him into context. Okay, and so context will maybe make me a little more sympathetic. But am I concerned about where a printer goes? Sure, and I'm even more concerned when he starts this in the law. But that's another, that's a few more weeks yet. All right. <clears throat> okay, good. Let's see what else we got here with the fleeting time we have left. Page one forty-three. This is kind of cool. <clears throat> Very top of the page, three lines in. For it is the symbol which separates the sacrament from the sermon. In the content of the word of promise, they are identical. And then, so he's going on here, and then we go on to the um, page 145 where he talks about the idea of the mirror symbol. Wait, I'm supposed to be on page 143 is where I want. I want to be on 143. Bottom of 142 to 143. Sorry about my pages. Very bottom of 142, last two lines. And now it is important to understand that this connection between the preaching of the gospel and the sacrament does not mean a spiritualizing of the idea of the sacrament, but a sacramentalization of the message. You get that? So what he's saying is, the primary thing is not necessarily even the word in its vapid out there-ness, but it's the idea of the concrete specificity of the sacrament, and actually what preaching does is it sacramentalizes the word because it makes it concrete and specific right now, right here. That's cool. And that's outward word. And here he is affirming it and praising it, and he likes it. So in other words, it's not choosing one or the other. It's being careful to hold the tension both full blast. Brian. Can't we, can't we do that when we read the Bible to ourselves? I'm not saying, I'm not saying that it, reading the Bible takes the place of preaching or anything like that. Right. But doesn't, don't we find that when we, we read the Bible, we equate it to our lives as well? Like, you might. But you're probably doing it because you're putting it in the context of all the preaching you've heard and all the teaching you've heard. But, so the church is still there. I, like, I, I don't know. Like, my problem with Peter is he says it's, it's this way and... and because and he's there's, trying. There's no, there's no happy medium. No, there's not. There isn't. And, no, and, right. and, and there isn't. There, there should be. In reality, yes. Yeah. Reading the Bible is a nice thing to do. Yes. But is it as good as going to church and her preaching? Well, no. no. But you should no. still do it. Sure. But see, in our circles, don't we have a tendency to almost say personal Bible reading is more important than going to church? How many people would sign on to that? What's more important? Reading my Bible every morning for a whole week or going to church on Sunday? Which is more important? No, not a yes. Which one would Luther say is most important? Going to church. Absolutely. 
You go, and not that, because that's where the preaching of the word is from God's chosen man. Luther says this. He says, you go home and read your Bible, it's not as effective or fruitful as hearing the word preached. So what Prender says is, it's I not as effective, so just screw not, it. Well, it sounds that way. Yes, and Prender is definitely pushing in that direction. So you, Brian, bring the balance back and be happy. All right. Now, I'm almost out of time. I want to go to 164. This is one of the best parts of Prender. This is really cool. 164, I'm about five lines down. That the word is gospel and gives Christ to us is simply another way of saying that it gives us to Christ so that he becomes the one who directs us, not we the ones who use him. That is so cool. So you see, the gospel doesn't give us Christ. So now I've got Jesus in my life. I'm going to go, what am I supposed to do with Jesus in my life? Off I go. So Jesus becomes my completion. No, the gospel gives me to Christ and I'm lost in him. You see, and that's the problem with this. It starts to sound too manipulative. So I'm going to read the Bible so I get some insights into my life today. Bad. <clears throat> what? What's wrong with that? You're manipulating. You're using instead of being used. You see, this is, this is where Prender's going. This is really cool. So we go on further. This last expression is perhaps a little more striking than the first one. To express the matter in this way, that the Word is in Christ, not Christ in the Word. That the Gospel gives us to Christ, not Christ to us. So the Word is in Christ, not Christ in the Word. Which is more important, Christ or the Word? Christ. Christ. So Christ comes in His Word, but the Word is in the thing of Christ, has the significance of underscoring the fact that we are not anthropocentric in our perspective when we speak about the Spirit's work. The statement that Christ is present in the Word may be interpreted anthropocentrically. That means that Christ is understood as that which the heart demands, as the satisfaction of an individual religious urge. Such an anthropocentric concept of Christ has not been found, both in orth has been found in both orthodox and pietistic circles. You bet it has. You know, Christ comes and makes me complete. This is what you hear all the time from evangelicals. All the time. That's what pietistics are, evangelicals today. But it is not Lutheran. And the gospel may be understood anthropocentrically as the word which gives us the desired peace in the sense of religious harmony. Such an understanding of the word gospel has been found rather often, but it was not Luther's view. See, all the stuff we assume and take for granted, it's not Lutheran. In Luther's teaching of the sacrament, it is seen that Christ is not present as the one who satisfies the desire of the moment, but as the one who takes our whole life into his sphere of work toward the eternal goal, whether this leads through life or death, through inner conflict or peace. He is present in the word as the one in whose hand the word has been placed and only in this manner. In Luther's teaching of the sacrament, it is seen that the gospel is not a word that merely brings rest and peace, but a word which gives us our whole life into the hands of the living Christ. So you see, Jesus is not the missing piece to make your life complete. He is the fundamental reality into which you are fit. And then everything starts to find its place. But you're the cog. Jesus is not the missing piece for you. You are the thing that needs to be fit into the story and reality of Christ. So the gospel doesn't give you what you're missing and fill you with peace. The gospel fills you with Christ, puts you in his story, and now your life becomes miserable and really full of suffering because you walk with Christ. But it eventuates in the peace and fullness of Christ, so that's cool. Who knows where you're going to go? It's, it's, he's not in control. Yeah, I mean, he's not manipulatable. You can't control him. He's just going to do what he wants to do, and away we go. That's the gospel. Prender just nails that, and that is so right on the money. Very good. Now, so when Prenter is attacking a rationalized doctrine of verbal inspiration, he has in mind too much emphasis on this, too much trying to have it all pinned down, trying to complain, have it all laid out. Is he denying verbal inspiration? No. He's just saying we put too many eggs in that basket, and here's the big problem. We start trusting our doctrine of verbal inspiration instead of trusting the living reality of Christ present for us. And I think that is a legitimate criticism that we need to contemplate a little bit. Do we sometimes start to be more confident in our, there, we've got the word laid out perfectly clear, or are we putting our confidence in Christ? And the difference is dramatic and profound and keeps on playing out all over the place 